Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, Discussion Bound. My name is Christy McMillan. I'm the Director of Learning and Engagement here at the Asheville Art Museum. And I am joined by Mary Emma Harris, uh, who is our special guest. Mary Emma, I see you. Let me go ahead and unmute you. See if we can get that figured out. Mary Emma is uh, recognized as one of, um, you know, the, the country's scholars in um, most prominent scholars in Black Mountain College. She has been studying Black Mountain College since 1969. Uh, her book, which you may have in your collection, called The Arts at Black Mountain College, is one of the most influential publications on the history of BMC. It's, a, it's based upon more than 300 interviews of former, former faculty and students. It's recently been described as the definitive account of a unique educational experiment and the artists and writers who conducted it. She replaces the myth of the college as a haphazardly conceived venture with a portrait of a consciously directed liberal arts school that grew out of the progressive education movement. Mary Emma has lectured and conducted seminars on BMC in such venues as the Bauhaus Dessau, the Smithsonian Institution, the Guggenheim Museum, the Detroit Institute of Arts, Pratt Institute, Kobe College in Japan, the Getty Research Institute, and closer to home, the University of North Carolina in both Asheville and Chapel Hill, and of course, the Asheville Art Museum. Please welcome me, uh, please help me in welcoming Mary Emma. Before we get started, I have just a couple of notes. You probably noticed as you were getting logged on that your microphones and video were muted by default. If at any time you'd like to turn on your video so that we can see who we're talking to during the discussion today, please feel free to do so. And in just a moment, I will also make it so that folks can unmute their microphones. Please do choose a quiet room and close the door. Silence any alerts from nearby devices as they can be pretty distracting. If you do uh, choose to turn on your video, try not to sit in front of a window, lamp, or other strong light source as it can make it hard to see you. Use headphones and a microphone for best sound quality. While you can log in using uh, your smartphone, we do recommend using a desktop, laptop, or tablet in order to see slides, meeting tools, and each other on a larger screen. Please make sure that your screen name includes your first name and last initial or your first name and last name, again, so that we know who we're talking to during the discussion today. There will be a few uh, ways to ask questions or make comments during the program. In just a second, I'll make it so that you can unmute your microphone uh, when Mary Emma or I ask for questions or comments or if you have any questions or comments uh, throughout the program. You can also type anything in the chat box. A third way is to raise your hand in the participant sidebar. Either Mary Emma or I will call on you and unmute your microphone. Just a final note, we are recording today, so if you prefer not to be recorded, please make sure that your video and audio remain muted and use the chat box to submit any questions or comments that you have. So while we do have uh, some questions, um, and I will sort of pull them up uh, during the hour if we need them, we do encourage you to sort of jump in and ask uh, questions and make comments throughout the time. So I think that I have now unshared my screen um, so that you can see everyone. I'm going to also make it now so that uh, you can unmute yourself if you would like um, to jump in, make a comment, ask a question. Um, we do recommend, please, though, to leave your microphone phone off if you're not ask, uh, asking a question or making a comment. Um, so Mary, Emma, I also understand that we have uh, some other special guests today. Would you like to introduce them? Mary, Emma? Mary, Emma was having problems with her microphone earlier. There you go. I can hear you. Uh, Aiko Cuneo, who is the daughter of Albert Lanier and Ruth Asawa. And is Paul here or other members of the family here? Um, I saw Aiko. And Aiko, if you could just unmute yourself. There you go. Okay. I don't know who else is here because I can only see the top part of the screen. Okay. <laughs> I think Paul would chime in if he's here. Yeah. 
Okay, I, I'm having video issues, but when other people are talking, I'll go in and check my settings. Okay, um, no problem. Anyway, Ico is one of Ruth's two daughters. Um, she is an artist herself and an educator. Um, she lives in San Francisco. She now is um, on the Cape and about to head back, I understand, to San Francisco. Um, she has devoted the past few years of her life, along with her sis sister Addie, to organizing Ruth's work and getting everything in the computer. This has been a monumental task, to say the least. I think she's now going to separate herself a bit and begin doing her own artwork again. Um, I had the privilege of knowing the Asawa Lunir family since 1972, when I was on a cross-country trip to San Francisco doing research and Willie Joseph, a rather eccentric Black Mountain person in Cincinnati, called Ruth and said, this young woman, young then, <laughs> Mary Harris, is heading to the West Coast to take care of her. And I ended up spending about six weeks in the household and have been there many times since. It's been an enormous privilege in my life. Um, so I'm gonna sign off now and see if I can get my visuals working. And okay. so see you, Michael. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mary Emma. Um, so I wanted to start off uh, today, first of all, I wanted to say, um, and I'll, I'll also ask anyone to chime in, um, this was one of the better book selections I think that I've made in a while. I see people shaking their heads. Um, I don't know about you all, but I learned an enormous amount reading this book um, about Ruth Asawa, um, but also I think it was written in a very um, accessible way. Um, so Marianne, Miriam and I talked a little bit yesterday about how we wanted this program to run, and we thought that it might be just good to start with a very brief um, bio um, of Ruth Asawa in case anyone hadn't um, read the book. Um, so uh, Ruth uh, Asawa is one of the most important artists in our collection. We have a number of works by her, both uh, sculptures, works on paper, um, and also works by other Black Mountain College students of her, showing her. Um, and so I, I have some of those uh, in case we wanted to pull them up later. Um, but she was born in 1926 um, in Southern California, uh, where both of her parents uh, had immigrated from Japan um, to uh, work the land and to be truck farmers, which was a, uh, a term that I had never heard before, but basically that they were raising uh, fruits and vegetables that they trucked in to sell um, at markets. Um, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, um, uh, Ruth's father uh, was arrested in the fields um, and, and taken away from the family, uh, and the family was subsequently um, interned uh, in a camp uh, for Japanese Americans, first at the Santa Anita racetrack, um, and then in Rauer uh, camp in Arkansas um, with thousands of other Japanese Americans um, who of both first and second generation um, who were uh, taken from uh, their homes on the west coast and moved to the inland uh, with the thought that uh, they could be spying for Japan. Um, she uh, ended up leaving the camp uh, before the end of the war um, in order to attend college um, at Milwaukee Teachers College, where she planned to study to be uh, an art educator. After three years there, the fourth year for art educators is usually um, when they do their work placement um, and teach in a school. And she was then told after three years at the, at the college because of her um, Japanese origins that she would not be allowed to teach. Um, and I think she was probably pretty devastated um, because she wasn't able to, to complete what she went there for. Uh, she had friends there um, in Milwaukee who were interested in, in going to Black Mountain College in order to pursue um, a very liberal arts education and to really experiment with different ways that they could incorporate the arts um, into um, their education and also to study with some of the amazing uh, faculty and other students that were there. And so I believe it was in 1946, Iko um, and Mary Emma, that she went 
uh, or I should say came to Black Mountain since we're here yeah. in Asheville um, and ended up being uh, here, I think, for about three years before she left in 1949. Um, here she studied uh, color and um, form and uh, the interaction of uh, design elements with uh, both of the Albers, um, who had uh, an amazing opinion of her ability as an artist and encouraged her um, through the rest of her career. Uh, she also made connections with um, Buckminster Fuller, who was then here experimenting with uh, different architecture um, forms, and he was also someone that played a big role um, in the rest of her um, career. Um, she studied dance, which was something new that I learned. I didn't know that she was into modern dance, um, but really got this sort of well-rounded um, education um, and um, encouraged the, the spirit of curiosity that I sort of understood about her as a person um, that lasted throughout the rest of her life. Um, she also very fatefully uh, met Albert Lanier there, who would become her husband. He was an architecture student uh, who was from uh, Georgia originally, and uh, she and Albert decided to um, settle in San Francisco where he had come um, I think a year or so beforehand. Um, they proceeded to have six children. Uh, she herself was one of seven, I believe, Iko. Um, six. She was one of six and she wanted. I was one of, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so uh, over the years, they grew their family um, and she um, uh, was not only uh, influential um, as an artist and, and making um, her signature wire sculptures, works on paper um, and fountains there in San Francisco, um, but really I think was important in her career to contribute to arts and education there in San Francisco. Uh, she lived a long life. Um, she passed away in 2008. 13? 2013, <laughs> so not too long ago, um, and really, really made her stamp um, there in San Francisco, and uh, since uh, sort of later in life and since uh, she passed away has really uh, become, I think, finally gotten her due um, uh, as, as an artist and has been recognized um, as one of the great mid-century and beyond uh, sculptors. So um, someone who I mentioned is very, very important in our collection um, and someone that I uh, enjoyed learning more about enormously. So I'd like to uh, just sort of pose a, a question to the group. Um, what were your initial reactions uh, to the book and maybe what were, what were some interesting things that you learned about Ruth Asawa? Feel free to jump in, anyone. I thought the book was fascinating and I too learned a lot. And um, I thought Ruth was a pioneer. I mean, in all ways, in terms of when she married Albert, when they were barely allowed to even be married because of the, um, he was from Georgia and she was of Japanese origin and fighting for the arts, even back in the seventies in school and for education. And uh, I just, I found an interesting note um, on this August 13th, she's going to be honored on the US postal stamps. There's gonna be stamps of her, which I think is wonderful. So. And she said children were like plants. And uh, I thought it was wonderful at the end too that she has become a work of art with her ashes combined with uh, Adam and her husband. And uh, I thought that was uh, very nice. Yeah, that was incredibly poignant um, when I read that. I just, I just learned something on every single page. And I had known um, uh, Ruth primarily in the lens of her uh, her being a student at BMC and sort of the legacy of her work at BMC. Um, I, I, I knew that she had gone to San Francisco um, and worked in education and uh, had made fountains, but that was not 
something that I knew as much about. So everything after BMC was like a revelation to me. Um, Doris, I, I see you there. You have been very enthusiastically nodding. I know that Ruth Asawa is one of your favorite artists. What, what did you think about the book and what were maybe some of the things that stood out to you? Well, Ruth Asawa is one of my favorite artists, and honestly, I wasn't familiar with her until I started volunteering at the Asheville Art Museum and saw that magnificent um, wire sculpture that we have, and um, became um, fascinated by her background as an internee, but didn't know much more about her until reading this book. And like you, Christy, I thought that, um, the, um, the book was, it was just so, it, I got so engrossed in it, like I didn't want to put it down. It read, um, it yeah. just was such, uh, 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 so well written and, and so interesting and a real page turner. And I think that one of the things that really impressed me um, that I hadn't thought about before was um, despite all of the difficulties in her life, starting when she was young and, and being interned and then being a woman artist at a time when um, she wasn't getting perhaps the respect that she deserved and having the, um, which seemed, I think to her, it sounded like from the book, the joy of raising all of these children in addition to working. But I mean, that had to be really, um, really difficult. Um, the, the, um, all of the, um, uh, incidents with trying to get the fount that one fountain, um, going and, and the, the, the pushback that she had about that. Um, but yet she just seemed to continue to have that drive. She must have been a wonderful person to know because um, at least from the book, she seemed like really positive. Like it didn't, nothing really seemed to set her back. And I, I just have so much more respect um, for her um, as a person in, uh, after reading the book and made me appreciate her art more. And, in and just one more thing, when I, I always hesitate to read biographies of artists that I really like because after I read the biography of the artist, I usually, that I know it's not supposed to, but it influences my opinion of their art usually in a negative way. And this just made me love her more. So. <laughs> So Miriam, I see that your microphone and video are now working perfectly. <laughs> well, so Anka, what is your response to what Doris Pavish just said? Did you think Ruth ever became discouraged? Was that, did you experience that? Okay. Am I unmuted now? Yeah, you're fine. We can hear you. I'm fine. Oh, okay. Um, you know, she, she, she might have been discouraged at times, but she was quietly, she did it quietly. Like she didn't get the Guggenheim grant. What was it? Five times she applied and she never got the Guggenheim grant. It just made her work harder. And um, she didn't spend time being bitter or thinking negative thoughts. It was okay. What's my next project? She just kept moving. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. I love uh, the pictures too of, um, and what does another thing about this book that I thought was great is it was almost a picture or an illustration mm -hmm. or a letter or something on every page that really helped me um, to understand her as a human being, I think, more. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that when when we uh, often look at uh, artists' work in the museum, um, there's a it's very easy to sort of divorce the artist from the work um, and mm -hmm. and to think of uh, you know that the only thing that she did in life was looping these amazing beautiful wire sculptures, <laughs> but her life was so much richer than that. And I loved uh, the letters um, both that she was writing. You know, I, I don't know how the author found some of those things. You know, the the letters that she was writing to her congressman and. Um, you know, to different uh, people uh, working in museums or the private letters that she was writing to the Alberses, or I'm sure that the, the family probably shared the ones, the love letters between her and your dad. But, you know, I just really felt mm. like um, it, this book humanized her in a way. Mm. But Mary Emma and I were talking yesterday and we were wondering, Aiko, um, was there anything that wasn't in the book that maybe you wish had been? That's a good question. Um, I think she really, I think she captured my mother. You know, she had to go to, she went to Stanford. She worked uh, in her archives for over two and a half years. She has 12 filing cabinets full of 
folders of work that she, of, you know, papers that she had Xeroxed. She's a really amazing researcher. Um, and so I no, I think, you know, she did a great job for the, it's a very accessible book and for the amount of, you know, words that she could write. And I think Chronicle Books did an amazing job of adding photographs throughout the book. It just yeah. made so much more sense. Just the photograph know. of, of uh, yeah. I think it was your brother, Adam sitting on the floor naked and the kids sort of all yes. around <laughs> while, yes. while Ruth is there working. Uh, I, I've seen that photograph before, but it became so much sweeter to me um, mm -hmm. seeing it and, and uh, learning more about the family life. Mm -hmm. What are some other thoughts um, that some of you have about the book uh, or things that you've learned um, uh, about Ruth Asawa or the art scene, I guess, um, at BMC, or some of um, what she uh, was doing after having read the book. Christy? Go ahead, Kathy. And, and Aiko. What an honor it is to um, have Aiko as a part of it. I feel like I sort of know you in a little bit <laughs> from the book. <laughs> um, and I can only imagine what your childhood must have been like. Um, growing up in that world with all of those beautiful things around you and uh, it seems so down to earth at many times. Um, but what really also um, was a gift for me in this book was um, the range of emotional strength that your, your mother obviously had and how she embraced um, Shinto and Buddhism um, along with knowing when to dig in her heels and, uh, <laughs> and push for royalties for artists mm -hmm. um, and uh, wanting that bronze uh, <laughs> relief which she finally got and the struggles putting that together. It was, um, it was the emotions um, and that range of emotions that was remarkable to me. Uh, and I would be curious to know how, how, how it was for you as a child Growing you up know, in the Asawa Lanier household. Yes. <laughs> well, I you wish know, I could have been there. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, you know, we grew up, um, it was like, it, it was what we, what we knew. It's the only thing we knew. And everything was seamless. She worked all over the house. So it wasn't just like she went to her studio and she never called it work. You know, we, we thought she was playing because her, she made her work, her, her, her artwork fun and she also made work fun for us. So we were part of the project. Raising us was part of the project and we were very necessary to the running of that household because there were six kids. My father went off to work and we had to help, you know, run the household, just like a farm. It, it reminded me actually um, of, the, of the way that I conceive of um, Black Mountain College being, that everybody plays their role and everyone's important. And I, and I was thinking as I was reading the book, you know, she went from BMC, married Albert, started having the kids, and, and it, the house was just like that. Everyone had their role, <laughs> everyone had their part, um, and, and sort of reminded me too of um, the way that she was brought up on the farm. So, yes. you know, a very um, sort of collaborative and family, um, like everyone is family because it, it seemed like the people that were neighbors and friends also had the roles that they played in that in the home as well. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I think, Go ahead, Mary Emma. I, one thing that surprised me was how even the Black Mountain Ruth was known as being very shy, very quiet, very shy, but very involved in things. And it was amazing to see, even as a young child, how um, quietly aggressive she was, like when and even in the, in the camp, the letters to try to get her father united with the rest of the family. Um, you know, that determination was there. Um, you know, there's some people who are just sort of a force, and Ruth definitely was a force. Um, but she, I think she found her footing in Black Mountain in many ways. Um, I think Black Mountain prepared her. She had taken art classes, but she had never been part of a creative community. And Black Mountain was a creative community. Um, arts were integrated into every aspect of life in the college, and they were compartmentalized. So she could do music, she could do dance, she could do theater, um, she could do all of these things. And I think the the 
can she fit in this creative community prepared her for life in San Francisco. It sort of jump-started her for being part of an avant-garde bohemian community. Um, so I, where was I going from here? Um, there were a couple of other things I was going to say about Black Mountain. One is she, after having been interned and having done menial work in Milwaukee so that she could go to school at Black Mountain, she was equal to everybody else. Um, you know, it was a multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multicultural background. And um, I think that she began to, find, began to find herself there in the community. She had wonderful mentors like Fuller and Albers, people who had faith in her, um, who encouraged her. Um, and so there was one other, of course, another important, the most important thing perhaps about Black Mountain is she met Al. And reading their letters, it's just, it amazed me their wisdom at that age, what they were up against and how wise they were um, in what they were going to be confronting. Um, so that's enough. That's, um, I'm signing off. Okay. <laughs> Miriam, just so that you know, your mm -hmm. fan, when it rotates over to you, it, it hits your <laughs> microphone and kind of oh. sounds like wind. The, the, I'll turn it off. The storm destroyed my air conditioner so i'm without air conditioning now but i can do without oh. it wow. okay, okay. <laughs> thanks miriam <laughs> so, well, this is, i need a church fan <laughs> go ahead I, I found that Ruth had this inner strength because from when she was three years old with the diphtheria to later years with lupus and there was just this inner strength, like there was nothing that could stop her. You know, every adversary, you know, everything that came was not an obstacle to her. And she fought to have that sense of community with the children and for so much in art education. Um, I thought that was amazing. And she didn't want to be thought of as a woman or a Japanese, but as an artist, you know, which I thought was uh, fascinating as well. I'm glad that you brought that up um, because it's one of the things that stuck out to me as well. And I think that there were two, two times in the book uh, where uh, Marilyn Chase specifically mentioned this. Um, and it's something that um, we talk about with our docents um, when we're doing our docent training is, um, you know, we we like to make sure that when we're giving our tours or talking about our collection that we demonstrate the diversity of our collection. Um, and how do you balance that with artists uh, like Ruth who very clearly wanted to be recognized on her own terms as an artist full stop without um, the, you know, not as a woman artist or not as an Asian American artist, but just as an artist. And, and I think that um, especially with uh, collections like ours that focus in modern and contemporary art, it's something that we have to weigh. Um, you know, how do you sort of tell a multiplicity of stories, but still honor the way that the artist wanted to be understood? Um, Pat and Mike, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that I thought uh, the transition from abstract to the more realistic uh, works was very interesting to me and something I was totally unaware of. And um, I, wa I want to look at them. It makes me want to go out and see some of her those works because I'm not, I wasn't familiar with them. Um, are they still surviving? Are they still around? They are. They are. There's one that was taken out of the building, but it's not in the book. Um, but all of them are there uh, in, in the city. You can see them for free They're out on the street, um, public pieces. Billy? One of the things that impressed me the most was how inclusive she was, how inclusive of ideas and thoughts. I always felt, particularly the way the book was written, that I was a part of the group. And that was portrayed, I think, in her, her love and inclusion. I mean, she made adding another baby to the house no big deal. <laughs> I mean, it was just a, here's more here's more and it was more love more creativity it was always reaching out and bringing in 
Yeah, that inclusivity, um, which I think is really striking because um, she had her her share of challenges of being excluded. Um, that for her to have such an open and inclusive heart and way of living her life is just a real testament to the the strong woman and strong sense of character that she had. Mm -hmm. um, Kathy, you had remarked that her range of emotional fortitude was truly remarkable. Did, did you want to say anything else about that? Well, um, I just found that um, that she, she, she had inner strength in her. Um, at least that's what came through um, even during uh, her hardest times um, with lupus uh, and many of the other battles that she fought. Um, it feels like she was um, sort of always a blossom, even when she was in the um, camps. Um, and then she got to Black Mountain College, and that's when I think that blossom opened up. Um, and then she just, um, she just was incredible, uh, incredibly sensitive. Yeah. So Joey, and feel free, Joey, to unmute yourself. You, there you are. You had said <clears throat> that you were excited to read that, um, that Ruth had gifted one of her wire sculptures to Lorna Blaine Halper, um, and that Lorna was her secret scholarship angel at Black Mountain College. Um, is this the one in our museum? So I, I checked, Joey, I'm glad that you asked that question with our director, Pam, and I believe that the one that she gave to Lorna is not the one in the museum, but it's the one that Lorna already had that's the one in the museum, and I can pull that up mm -hmm. to show it. Um, the mm -hmm. one that we have here is iron wire, and I believe that the one that she gifted to Lorna was copper wire, if I'm not mistaken. But um, yeah, that was one of the things that made me really excited as I was learning, because I was trying to connect the dots <laughs> with the works in the museum, which is always really, really interesting to learn um, sort of the history of those objects. Um, but I, I didn't know, and I think um, a couple of our staff didn't know that Lorna had actually um, been that sort of secret benefactor um, for Ruth Asau. So I'm, I'm wondering if, um, if there were other things in the book that uh, you guys were really surprised or um, found really interesting things that you learned. One thing that I felt that um, her artwork was so um, representative of everything in her life, the, the tightness of the weaving, the process, the craft, um, the way in which it represents uh, writing, drawing, and the uh, difficulty of it, uh, the way in which she was inside of it when she was knitting it. Um, and, and I thought she probably represents Black Mountain better than any of the other artists in that sense of collective creativity, it, uh, which her whole life was really that collective uh, creativity. Uh, the way she brought her neighborhood in, uh, all of San Francisco. I think um, her recognition, I'm sure, is accepted and understood in San Francisco. It just wasn't in the New York world. Um, I mean, initially, but then sort of forgotten. Um, but that didn't bother her, again, because, and the intensity of her being is in that work. And I, I guess I hadn't understood how uh, inclusive her work is of her being. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought that that was really interesting too in sort of the latter chapters um, that Marilyn Chase talked about uh, or maybe posited reasons why um, Ruth had been largely understood uh, more as a regional artist in California rather than nationally recognized and steps that um, her gallery representation were taking to change that. Um, I mean, to me, she's always been Ruth is how it just sort of writ large in my mm -hmm. head and I hadn't really um, thought about the fact, you know, why would she not ha have been understood that way throughout her working life and that she had very specifically chosen to uh, 
sort of stop sending her work to New York. I had no clue um, sort of the financial obligations that artists uh, had in order to, to, you know, pay for their work to be shipped. If it was damaged in transit, having to go and, and uh, uh, you know, triage the work so that it could be shown, paying for it, what the, the advertising for it to be seen, mm -hmm. basically paying for everything and mm -hmm. taking a gamble that it wouldn't uh, pay off. And of course, uh, with her and uh, Albert's expanding family, she couldn't afford to take those sorts of gambles. And so she chose to, to keep her work um, shown there in California where the, the I guess the expenses to, to have it on view uh, were less for her. Um, and, but I, I think that she had such a sort of full life that not having yeah. that sort of glitz and glam of the New York show or, you know, the major recognition around the world, it didn't bother her. Would you, would you say that that's accurate, Mariama and, and Aiko? Uh, I let Aiko speak. Um, I think, you know, I think that she probably knew that one day her work would be appreciated on, 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 the, on a greater level. Um, but, you know, about her work, she had a hard time parting with her work, too. She kept a lot of her work because it was really hard for her to sell them. Because if you sell a piece, what does it give you? It gives you, you know, $500 or $1,000, and then you, you pay your mortgage or you do something with it, and the sculpture is gone. She really wanted to, to hang on to these. These were almost like her children, too. And so she hung on to her major pieces until she, you know, until she died, you know, so it was, um, yeah. There's that really striking photograph sort of towards the end of the book where, you know, we had heard that uh, up in the raft rafters of the house mm -hmm. that all of the sculptures were hanging, but there was finally this photograph where we could see that, like, it was so magical looking, um, the way that they hung there. And I'm sure that you all, as kids, they were just sort of the landscape of the house. You didn't really think about them in any special way. Exactly. Exactly. They were there. They were there. And they are no longer there now, you know, that they've been, you know, dispersed. And, and um, but the house is still in our family. My brother has the house. So it's really wonderful that we can still all gather there in the house. Are there any of the sculptures that were there hanging from the rafters still there? Very few. Very, very few. Yeah. I had read that the the first one uh, that went for so much at auction, I guess, it, that, that set the first record for her, that um, mm -hmm. the proceeds from it went to pay for her care, which I thought was really beautiful oh. and poetic. It was wonderful. It was wonderful to have that, to, to keep them in their home. That was the one thing my parents wanted more than anything was to be able to our house. Yeah. And we, we helped them do that. Yeah. Mary Emma? Speaking of her parents, um, I must say that I was there over the years, last years of their life, and what the children did to, prepare, to take care of their parents in their final years was beyond amazing. I'm so glad that I still came to help them. Um, yeah. But Iko, we've talked about Ruth, but Ruth and Al were really a partnership. Um, what, how do you see their relationship in terms of the household and their art? You know, I didn't really realize what a great partnership they had until, you know, I was taking, helping to take care of them and, and seeing her and taking care of her work. It was an amazing partnership. I think it comes out in your writings. It comes out in Marilyn's writings. Uh, and I saw that happening. She, he helped her with her, her um, engineering drawings because she couldn't do that. He hung her shows. He designed her shows. He was such a silent partner supporter. And she could not have really done it, I don't think, without him. Um, but he was so proud of her. And um, it, was a, it was like that Black Mountain kind of, you know, partnership that, that, that came through, like Ani and Joseph. And, and, and we were all part of that partnership. All the children were part of that partnership, too. I would note, I would note also that not many men <laughs> could have survived being Ruth's husband and <laughs> that household. He really did 
from what I could see, give her enormous support. Yes, definitely. Yeah, they and seemed vice like they versa. Were, they were yeah. made for each other, exactly. That she was supporting him um, just as much as he was supporting her. Um, I think your dad was way ahead of his time. <laughs> <laughs> Right, and you know, they went to school together. So that was, I think that was really kind of set the, the tone was that they went to school and they, after, just for one year, they were there together. And they talked about it for a year when their letters were going back and forth across the country. And you could see that there was a partnership there already. And it just continued. Um, it, everything was a challenge and they would face it head on and um, giggle <laughs> when things didn't go right. And then figure out how to solve the, the, the problem. And they did it together. It really struck me um, reading the love letters, um, how serious they were sort of from the very beginning. But I, mm -hmm. I kind of got the feeling though that your dad was a kind of mirthful person. <laughs> he, he was, and I think, you know, I've thought about those letters and now I realize that I think that your apart was really wonderful for them because they were together with this writing and their feelings and their truths and we're all coming out, but they didn't have to be there to touch each other, you know? And I think that that was really a healthy thing to happen. And I'm so glad that they didn't burn those letters because my mother thought my father had burned them. And he said, no, I thought you had burned them. And <laughs> here they are, still around. I get the feeling though that your mom didn't get rid of anything and probably the, the, <laughs> um, the archives are probably just a treasure trove. I, I remember seeing, I think a video with you giving maybe a, a tour of the, of the home and studio and mm -hmm. you had held up uh, a drawing that she had done on a lunch bag and a drawing <laughs> that she had done on sort of a paper towel yeah. <laughs> and that all of yeah. that was there that she I, I think it was just sort of ingrained in her that everything is useful and oh. nothing is to be thrown away it was amazing did that trickle down to you guys as kids I, I know that you you all uh are artists whether that's your profession or not <laughs> but that you were sort of steeped in that as kids and it's carried <laughs> well, through. Well, you know, the thing is there was no one more prolific than, than my mother. None of us are, have that kind of, you know, prolific out, outcome of, of work. Um, we appreciate it. Um, but having to go through that house and having to sort all of those papers for three years and get them ready for an archive at Stanford, um, it, it teaches you that you want to like take care of that, that kind of stuff. <laughs> while you still can. Um, but what was wonderful is my parents were living downstairs in the house. Uh, they had set it up, they had planned to set it up for their care. And my sister and I were upstairs working in the rest of the house where my parents lived. And for two, maybe two and a half, three, almost three years, we were able to get my mom up and down the stairs so we could actually bring her up there and ask her questions and help her sort things. Um, and she was part of that. So that was really great that she could do that with us. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's very helpful because she can put a date on everything and tell you what its context was in a way that <laughs> not having someone yeah. there would make it difficult. Right. One thing that uh, Marilyn Chase uh, mentioned in the book, and I wish that she had talked about a little bit more, but since you're here, Iko, hopefully mm -hmm. you can fill in that gap, is uh, she had mentioned that your dad had uh, saved up and over the years purchased some of the adjacent properties uh, to the house and that mm -hmm. it became like a, a family compound, but she didn't sort of talk more about that. Where, who, who was living in those houses nearby? Was it uh, the kids and grandkids or... Yeah, they bought the building next door to them that had two units in it. And so uh, children uh, rotated through there, renting the basement apartment. But then May Lee, her assistant for many, many years and good friend, lived upstairs with her, with her friend. And that was partly how that partnership worked, is she lived right next door. And she could come over and work. And, and, um, and then my sister bought a house that her yard touches my parents' yard. And so that house got remodeled by my brother. My father designed the remodel. And so there were, th there were these three buildings that had, you know, Lanier's and Lee's all living <laughs> together and sharing the yards. I love it. it. It 
it made it so that the the younger generations were sort of coming up in the same big family that um, that your generation was coming right. up in. Um, so Kathy, you had a question over in the chat um, about the title of the book, and that was another thing that I also pulled out, so I'm glad that you mentioned that everything she touched, that Marilyn didn't really explain um, that the title and where that came from, but she sort of mentioned it in passing. It was uh, June Wayne, who was the founder of the Tamarind Workshop in Los Angeles that right. uh, Ruth attended, I think, for a month while you guys were younger and, and the... Um, the two neighbors months, pitched two in months. for two months and <laughs> two the neighbors months, yeah. pitched in to watch yeah. the kids mm -hmm. while she was away having you know her her Ruth time uh, she that June Wayne said anything she touches becomes art she could make art of a mud puddle if she wished to so I I'm guess that's where it's yeah that's yeah where that, that's where from. the title yeah. of the book mm -hmm. comes from but you know yeah. let's talk about that a little bit how do we see that reflected in her work or reflected sort of in her life uh, Pat and Mike I had a different question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine? Hold on. I'll come back to you, uh, Mike. Go ahead, Catherine. Can you unmute yourself? There you okay. go. Okay. So that is really what Black Mountain College was about. Their, their philosophy was that art is life and life is art. And apparently Ruth Asawa's work is just the most fabulous, her work and her life are a fabulous demonstration of that basic philosophy of Black Mountain College. So I wrote a thesis on Black Mountain College when I was in graduate school at University of Georgia and the title of that is The Effects of Black Mountain College on Concepts of Art in the United States. And I mean, her work is a great example of that. And when you really think about other artists who went there, before Black Mountain College, we basically had sculptures that were in the middle of a room. We had paintings that were two-dimensional and that were on a wall. But if you think about many of the artists, practically all the artists who we know who went there, things really changed. Like when Rauschenberg did his his quilt and his pillow on a canvas, I mean, suddenly it wasn't just a two-dimensional thing. It was a three-dimensional. It was going into another world. And that's what Black Mountain was about. And I didn't know anything about Ruth Asawa until I read the uh, New York Times article recently. And I'm thrilled that this is happening. So thank you. I'm learning so much. Thanks, Catherine. The wonderful thing about many wonderful things about Marilyn's book is that it's introducing a lot of people to Ruth, and even someone who's known her. And I must say, I was very impressed um, with the with the biography. But I, even though I had known her for what fifty years, um, I learned so much more about her, and my respect just went you know, blossom. <laughs> And I feel like I just, Mary, did you really appreciate her when you knew her? I think I did. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Mike. You had a question. Yeah, throughout the book, I got the impression that she gave a lot of the work away to friends. And I'm just curious how much of her output resides in people's homes that they just got from her. Well, you know, that's one thing that I wanted to say that um, about that I didn't think was in the book well enough is that she was the most generous person. She was very, very generous and she fostered generosity in all of us. And I think that she, I'm sure she got that from Black Mountain and from her parents. But the, the, she did give work away. She gave work away and um, she gave work to auctions, you know, for. Um, Adelaide Stevenson's campaign. She gave a piece to that campaign, and and that piece just surfaced recently. Um, so it's just um, they. It is dispersed, and you know our family's very large. There's 20 of us. There's six children. Five survive. We all have spouses, and we each have two children. So she's dispersed work among family, but she had she definitely did give to friends. Um, so there's a lot of work out there, and people time partying with it. We've yeah. Had, they don't. <laughs> yes. 
Yeah, I noticed in that uh, video that I mentioned, um, it was before you all had sold the Albers painting. Mm -hmm. And I, I, um, I, I know that for her, that was very uh, special, that painting, which she got in the same way that you're talking about. It was yeah, a yeah, gift yeah, to her yeah. um, from yeah. the Albers. Uh, Mary Emma, you wanted to say? A comment that I was one of the recipients of one of her sculptures. Mm -hmm. And I treasure it above everything. You know, when, I, when I'm down, I can just very, it's a very contemplative form. I can just look at that and remember the good things in life and the good people in life and the beauty of her work. And I must say that it was only when I was doing um, writing for a San Francisco art exhibit and really looked closely at her work from Black Mountain, especially that last year when she did extraordinary things, the genius, I mean, she was just, she was, the genius of her work just still overwhelms me. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Is there some record of all of her pieces? Did she keep, I mean, she seemed to keep everything. Did she keep a record of the pieces so they're not lost? <laughs> well, you know, she was not a really great record keeper that way, but she didn't throw things away. So in a sense, that's helped us with the records. So we definitely have a, a private internal catalog that we keep of all of her work. Yeah, so but we don't share that, yeah. I noticed, like, for example, our uh, hanging sculpture has a, a number. Is that an internal sort of record number that, the, that you all have assigned to it? Right, because, you know, most of her work is untitled. Untitled, right. So you can't have untitled, you know, you, you don't know what it is. So the extended non-titled description helps describe what the piece is. So we at least know if it's a looped wire or a tied wire, and then the number definitely identifies it. So we need to have that S number with the sculpture to identify it. Is there any plan to put together a catalog raisonne or? There's been talk of it, but not, not anytime soon. It's so much work. It is so much work. We have a pretty great catalog of our own internally, mm -hmm. but yeah. I mean, we've talked about Ruth's sculpture, but she also painted, she also drew um, you know, her, she worked in many different media. She was a printmaker. So we've talked about her sculpture, but there's a massive collection of other materials. Um, mm -hmm. which are wonderful. I mean, her drawings are just so extraordinary. Yeah, I actually, mm -hmm. I wanted to pull up um, some of the works from our collection, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, do that now, <laughs> if I can. Sorry. Give me just a second. Technical problems. All right, let me see if I can move this. Give me just a second. Maybe I'll, I have a question for Aiko while we do that. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of music did you listen to growing up? <laughs> we had classical music in the house, but not very often because, you know, the record players with six children, they, huh? didn't, sur yeah, <laughs> they didn't survive very well, but it was classical. So um, uh, we have um, a number of these beautiful uh, portraits uh, that were taken by Hazel Larson mm -hmm. Archer. Um, we have, uh, and they're wonderful because I think that they show Ruth and, and maybe this, these moments of um, just informal moments that she's spending with her friend because she was friends with Hazel before she even came to Black Mountain. She was part of that Milwaukee contingent. So they really show her and I think these uh, moments where she's having fun, you know, holding a rock, laughing. Uh, this one in particular, I think wow. always disarms me when she's, she's laughing. Um, but here's the sculpture that we were talking about. So the, with that record number then S372, it, it allows you to know, um, does S stand for sculpture? Yes, it does. Yeah. Okay, yes. mm -hmm. um, so it's the, and this uh, photograph, I think that someone uh, had mentioned the article, I think it was um, you, Catherine, that you had men mentioned the article that you read in the New York Times. Um, and in the photograph uh, where she's sitting on the floor with sort of um, photo uh, sculptures behind her, this um, sculpture is actually hanging in that photograph. Right. So it's from the 50s. Um, we also have this basket in our collection um, from the 40s, so while she was at um, Black Mountain, which was really the, um, 
uh, the genesis of her working in this um, uh, crocheted wire form when she came back from um, Mexico where, where she had seen people using them as egg baskets. So I think this is a really great example of her, you know, starting to explore that form. Um, I think in the book uh, was mentioned some of the stamps uh, that she had used. Uh, both of the ones that we have are BMC stamps um, that she used to make uh, larger prints on bigger pieces of uh, newsprint. So we have this double sheet stamp as well as the BMC stamp, um, which I, I'm guessing uh, was then a wallpaper design. Yes. Mm -hmm. From the 1950s. And a mattress ticking. And the mattress thicking, that's right, that's right. It's funny that that would be used um, as a mattress ticking when it, it says BMC, you know, it's not, um, <laughs> it's not branded with the mattress company, right? <laughs> no, they called it Alphabet. That was the, the name of the fabric was Alphabet. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. If, if you think about, if you think about making mud out of a mud puddle, puddle the double st sheet stamp was made in the summer of 48 when she was working in the laundry. And so there was a single sheet stamp and a double sheet stamp and she could just, you know, right. make art out of it. Let's see. So we also uh, have two uh, ink on paper drawings of Johanna Yalowitz. Um, and she was also brought up in the, in the book. And so I, I liked knowing that I had this visual image mm -hmm. of her as well. The two of them. And then we have, uh, I believe, two prints in the collection. Uh, both are Zipatones, which I'm not really familiar with that um, process. Um, but I think uh, this one here reminds me of Albers and Bolotowski, who are both instructors of hers um, at um, BMC. And this one here, which reminds me of baskets, hanging baskets. Mm -hmm. And then this uh, is the last thing that I wanted to show um, by her friend Elaine Schmidt Urbane. It was a painting um, of Ruth made in watercolor um, during their time at BMC, which I think is very sweet. This was hanging um, in the museum when we reopened uh, in November after our construction project. So uh, it is close to one o'clock, as hard as that is to believe. Um, and we haven't really talked a lot about her sort of later life and her legacy. Um, there was one quote uh, in the book uh, that actually concerned you, Aiko. Um, Late in life, when Ruth's daughter, Aiko, asked her what she considered her life's most important work, she paused and said, the schools, art and education, were the warp and weave of her life. Um, Aiko or Mary Emma, do you want to maybe comment on that a little bit? I, I, I love that that's what she went to, that that became the most important thing uh, later um, as she was, uh, I think, considering her legacy. Well, it was a very big part of her life, you know, in the end. And really what she wanted for children was what she had at Black Mountain College, you know, to work with practicing artists, um, people, artists who are actually making and doing the work. And um, she spent years on, on the schools. And I think that she wanted children to understand and have the joy. And adults can get this too. At any age, the joy of taking making something from nothing and having had the control over what you're making, what you're drawing, what, you're, what colors you're using and have a sense of control. Whether you become an artist or not, that wasn't important to her, but she wanted children to be under, able to understand that kind of joy from making art, dancing, singing. What's, so what's going for on with the school? The school is still up at McAteer and the, the downtown um, a building is, it's still, it has not, it, is, it has not happened yet. They're working on it. And of course we hope that, that it happens. We, is we it really looking do. positive? I have to say, I have to say yes, but you know, now in these times, I don't know what happened, what's well, going to take precedence or priority, but definitely it was a dream she had and she finally just couldn't fight that fight anymore, but um, her children are doing it and the city is trying to do it. And maybe the stamp will help, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Mary Emma, any last thoughts? Nope, 
Um, thank you, Ico. You really made this special. I know you're, are you leaving to Cape today, tomorrow? Thank you. Uh, no, we leave tomorrow. We leave tomorrow, go back home. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so, you. Oh, can I say one more thing? Yeah. That, that our family, me, me especially, I am so happy that the Asheville Art Museum took my father's um, Black Mountain work and have shown it. And it, it was in the Hammer Museum, so mom and dad were shown together. It was just, it's very emotional to me, but I'm really grateful that you take his work and you are taking care of it. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. And, and your family, of course, has been generous um, to us in making sure that um, these works um, are part of our collection and part of um, the legacy that we get to share with the public as well. So thank you. Um, it's, I know that um, you, have, you have been a part of her story here at the museum um, from helping to make sure that the works are in their best possible shape um, <laughs> and, uh, and making sure that we have um, that wide variety of not only her sculpture, which I think most people immediately think of, but also those works on paper um, that she, mm -hmm. I, I know personally, um, enjoyed creating and, and wanted to be part of the story that was told about um, her art making. Right. Um, so I the stamps, you. go ahead, Aiko. Oh, no, 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 I, yeah. oh, go ahead, Pam. Hi, I go, it's Pam. Sorry, I'm at home, so I can't oh, have... Oh, hi, Pam. <laughs> hi, I can't have video and audio at the same time at, at home for some reason. <laughs> um, but I just want to say that, actually, I love your father's work. Um, the studies that, and drawings that you've shared with us have been used over and over again in exhibitions with your mom's work and independently. I think they mm -hmm. show us, you know, how he thought as a maker of spaces uh, about the world around him. And I think they're incredibly Im important and, in fact, very beautiful. And I really appreciate you and your family sharing them with us and having our ability to share them with others is really special. So we thank you. It's nice having them together. It really is. Oh. It, they live That's on together partner. in the museum. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we should ask Chris yes. to store them next to each other, Pam, so that we can make sure that Al and, and Ruth can, can be together even together. Um, off you in the museum. Um, thank you all so much. Um, Aiko, it has been a real pleasure having you here today and really adding those personal touches um, that we got a glimpse of by reading the book. Mary Emma, always, always a pleasure to um, have you here to help guide us through and, and really understand that bigger picture of BMC and, and to understand its place um, in Ruth and uh, Albert's lives. Um, thank you all for being here, uh, for contributing your questions and your comments. Um, I know that uh, we didn't get a chance to get to everyone, uh, everyone's comments today, but I will make sure to share uh, those questions and comments with Aiko and Mary Emma so that you can, can get a feel for what people said. Um, the stamps go on sale in a couple days, I think. On the, the 13th. The on 13th, the 13th. At 1.30. I guess they don't, I don't know, they don't release them <laughs> until 1.30. Time. Okay. So, but you can yeah, pre-order yeah. them. I pre-ordered them yes. a few weeks ago when I first heard about it. So I right. can't Did wait you to get them. Oh, you, not, okay. no, not, yet. not, not yet. yet. Okay. I have to say too, um, we pre-ordered thousands of them um, here at the museum to make sure <laughs> that at least for the next year, everything that goes out of the museum will have a Rufus Atwood stamp <laughs> on it. So I go, we'll have to send you a, a thank you note and make sure that we have the Rufus Atwood stamp on it. Yeah. But, you know, as I said, she's so very important uh, to us and to the story that we tell um, of Black Mountain College that we wanted to make sure that she was also outwardly <laughs> represented in what was going on in the museum. So uh, Pam gave us approval to get thousands of those stamps. So it'll be on everything. Excellent. Um, so thank great. you all again for coming. Uh, it's been a great discussion. I wanted to mention that 
Uh, next month, we are going to be reading uh, A Fool's Errand, which is uh, a book written by Lonnie Bunch III um, about his journey um, making the National Museum of African American History and Culture um, in Washington, D.C. happen. Um, and so uh, that is our book selection for next month. Uh, if you can, uh, pick it up from Malaprops or your favorite independent bookseller so that we can make sure to uh, support support our friends um, in book in bookstores. Um, that date for that is, oh golly, I want to say it's maybe the 8th, but it's the second Tuesday um, in September at 12 o'clock, and we will be continuing on Zoom, I believe, through the end of the year, um, as we want to make sure that everybody stays healthy and safe. So enjoy the rest of your week. Great. Thank you again, Aiko Thank and you. Mary Emma, Thanks, and Mary. Uh, we'll see you guys again soon. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.